say thank you for coming, even though I have to force you. Uh, but jokes aside, no, this kind of thing is, is, is a tradition, and at one point it was very important in the school, and for whatever reason has been going down, and so enthusiasm and energy of part of you guys' experience. Um, it's a mistake on your part to don't come do it. I mean, these are the people who are wearing under some moment for one semester or more, but they don't will be teaching to you and teaching to others or come to your review. So I think it's a good moment for you guys to have and check what they have to say, what they do in their own world, and also to understand it's a way for you to hold them accountable for what they claim to or what they demand from you. So it's a good opportunity. I don't know how many of you were here on Wednesday for Bernard's lecture, but for Marcel and me, who were students of Bernard in Colombia 12, 10, 12 years ago, it was a great opportunity to have a chance to hand him on the other side and ask him about things. Uh, because that's how it goes, and that's how the discipline improves and change and become more useful to you. So, Please spread the voice among your colleagues and your fellow students about coming to these discussions on Friday. And this semester we have four lectures, one being the first one at lunchtime. But one thing I would like to introduce for you guys is let's see if we can make, we can make this more informal discussion, more informal conversation. In other words, this could be a more informal, relaxed environment in which in the middle of the lecture, you want to ask something to one, you should. And that, that's the whole point. It should be different than a Wednesday night lecture, which is a more formal. This one's supposed to be a more informal conversation, and hopefully, in the near future, we also will present to you guys a conversation and some new lectures and some discussions and other papers. Uh, but buy your food, bring your coffee, your drinks, and have lunch. It's only one hour, and not every week. But again, my point is, if you don't show up, you don't get to complain. And if you don't like the faculty, and you don't come to the party of them, at least for those who are a graduate, when you send the evaluation back and you don't make enough one, I'm going to check if you were in the lecture. If you were not in the lecture, we don't care about your complaints. Because you're not, no, but I'm serious about it. You're not taking seriously the dialogue. This is the opportunity that you have for these guys to go to get back to you and to give you a sense of what they're doing. Anyway. That's for the bureaucracy. Um, now, uh, I wouldn't say it's my pleasure to introduce one, uh, because that implies other things, but uh, just as I know, I, I, think it's a, I think it's a really interesting that one is our first faculty talk, semester. I think um, this has been so far a remarkable semester in terms of lectures and discussions. I think you, you, can, you guys can feel the energy in all the series of events that we have since the semester to start. But bottom line, I think more than ever, and I don't know how much is by design and how much is by serendipity, that I think the, the different series of discussions that we have are at the heart of the center of what the discipline is right now. The discipline is in multiple, multiple protocols, but they're basically, I would argue, there are two main approaches right now, which is people who approach uh, the, the, the practice of architecture, the teaching of architecture, the thinking of architecture in a way of isolating variables and focusing in certain narrow agenda because autonomous way and that helps in that sense some way the factory or some of the discussion and some other people are much more interested in cultural at large and what are the external forces that shape the society in which we live and how that impact and interact with this way. I would say one is more in that second and maybe correct me in the world. But our has been my sensibility, sometimes way too out there. Uh, I always joke that whatever, uh, I always think that if you guys ever saw the big Lebowski, one is a lot like Walter, the character, in the sense of no matter what the discussion is, always end in being about the whole world. <laughs> Uh, and that is kind of a joke, but also it's, in a serious way, it's a way that he understands the problem. The problem is it's never a micro problem. The problem is always a series of forces of interaction. I play any given time in which I'm changing, changing the time of art. They try to participate in that discussion. And in that sense, 
and in his practice, which is a very peculiar one, where one interacts between architecture, filmmaking, art installation, writing, and a little bit of art rating lately, even in informal capacity. So he had this ambition that not only that he argued for that idea of an architect, he practiced that idea of an architect, which one of the things that you as a student need to make accountable your professor for is they really stand up for what they argue that they are. And I think conversations and lectures like this are a good way for us to check the balance if that's true or not. So maybe what I'm just telling you about one is completely bold, or maybe I'm right the money, that's a good point. And we're going to see what he has to say to us in the next three, five minutes or one hour. Um, so, one. Thank you. I'll let you I'm gonna save my, my moves for for the end. So we can get this. Alright. I'll try not to answer my book. Like as a, as uh, I'm not suggested, by all means, uh, stop me halfway and ask questions if you have to. Um, what I, what I want to show today is what I consider my most uh, uncomfortable and most difficult to talk about dirty on in a way because because I think I think that uh, the point of these things like I'm not saying is to to open them up to to dialogue and this is the reason why we teach here is because I can like uh, many schools or most schools in the world is one of the few places where you are encouraged to put what you do at the very edge of your of your practices, including the teaching practice. So if you guys feel at the, being thrown at the very edge of the, of your own circumstances and abilities all the time, it's because you are, and because we are as well. And and, and part of the problem is to figure out what the problem of practice is and how you how to build yourself a a, a project base that is as uh, as true a match to the kind of uh, productive misfits that we tend to be. I think that if, if it weren't for that equation, I think a lot of us would be, would be somewhere else, whether teaching or, or doing something else. Um, so what I, what I want to talk to, uh, about you guys today is a slightly uh, uh, different offering of the thesis and the relation between between uh, uh, not necessarily between biology and architecture because um, I'm not that interested in, in science to begin with, but I'm interested in how to how to hack things that we know work over and over again. So um, take it for for what that means. And um, I'll show a few slides in the beginning. Then I will show uh, I will veer out of. of trying to explain these few key concepts. And so I will show just work. And then uh, and I'll show some, some movies here and there. But um, I'm going to also try to uh, and keep it to the, to the 45 minutes. Without, and I'm going to try to go at it without saying the whole word. But if Reza does that to me, I might have to. Yeah. 
qui a rejeté les quartiers. C'est un film de Jean-Luc Godard. Il est tourné en stop et tiré en couleur par GTC à la ville. Il a été produit par Georges de Beauregard et Carlo Conti, les sociétés Rome Paris Film, Concordia, Compagnia Cinématographique à Champion. So the, the, basis, the, the basic concept of where we start is that um, architecture exists in a, exists in a spatial temporal continuum in which while we have plenty of ways of accounting for the temporal site, there is nowhere near uh, as many ways to harness the techniques um, and the analysis of such things. Again, we have things that like program and function, things that we clearly uh, relate to, to how things happen rather than what they look like. But one of the starting premises is that we, don't have, we do not have enough ways to, to, to take that on. Um, this one you, you might have uh, uh, might relate, relate it back to Wednesday night. Um, again, it's back. Uh, as Arnaud said before, you know, we were part of, the, of, of uh, Bernard uh, Chumi's uh, Columbia School at the time, and I was always very surprised by how is it that somebody that was so dogmatic about certain aspects of taking that problem on would, on the other hand, allow something that was so uh, formal to emerge out of that same school. And what I realized was that there was this conflict between technology and culture that he found both productive and somewhat humanized, um, which which is one of the things that also underlies what I will show today. Um, and one of the basic uh, uh, tenets of that is that events do not just happen. They're the product of a certain construction, be it earthquakes, floods, uh, terrorist attacks. Um, there is no such thing as uh, the purely accidental. Those accidents are things that we construct, and those events are things that we aspire to. Um, one of the things I'm trying to allude to is also a, a slight variation of the definitions of, 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 of Spinozian affect or, or uh, Deleuzean, and Deleuzean surface, which is, again, not just to say that this is a way to describe form or time as evidenced by form, but rather a diagrammatic function of, of time a little bit more, more, more openly stated so that way. Um, and I think in order to understand this, we should get used to understanding that, that the, law, the, the effect of compositing techniques on, on visual culture, because I believe to a certain extent that our, our world is, at this point, almost entirely constructed out of this sensibility where we have this in, infinitely unfolding depth of, of image systems. In other words, there's the ability to put things inside things inside things inside things. It's like that silly part in Inception when the, when the, when, when the actress folds the, the two mirror planes and you see the world reflected infinitely against both sides. It's like standing that way. And I believe architecture would be caught up in that type of, in that type of space. Um, there's uh, Eugene Thacker, who is a, a, a media theorist, wrote a book called Biomedia a few, uh, a few years ago. I believe, I believe it, was, it was 2004. And his main question was, how does the information paradigm affect the, the biological? And um, he described things as incurably informed corporealities, which I see intensely reflected in, in, in Tarkovsky's work, for example, where, where you see this, this juxtaposition between material and behavior uh, superseding this traditional position of nature and culture that we often see laid out in the, in the, somewhere in the 20th century. 
And through these very uh, catalytic images, we, we understand a little bit of what I was uh, talking about before, referring to the idea that events do not just happen, that there is a way of uh, relating or intensifying material or behavior uh, mutually. Abstraction. I think that there is also another concept that underlies this, which has something to do with with abstraction, but not as a way to to again to decant uh, the natural world into something that is that prefers to to, to uh, synthetic uh, logic rather as a, as an alien thing. In other words, the abstraction belongs in the very possibilities of the the natural world in a way that we have not quite. Uh, addressed yet. Um, and, and this is, for me, another image out of the movie that I showed you the very that refers to that. Um, before I go to, to, to show you guys work, uh, Stan Brakhage. Uh, Stan Brakhage was an experimental filmmaker in the, in, in the, in the other East Coast uh, from New York. And this is a piece of his 1963 uh, moth light. The, the, what you see here are hand-built 16 millimeter frames. And if you guys know anything about uh, cinema, usually what you do is you run uh, vertically through a camera, uh, reactive film that at uh, the frame rate of 24 frames per second gets you a photograph. And 24 frames a second over time and movement gives you a moving picture. Uh, what he did instead, he was, he was trying to make a film about a relationship between a bug and a light source. And what he did instead is he built these 16 millimeter frames out of these super uh, landscapes that he built out of sticky tape in which he actually trapped in, uh, flies, moths, uh, lamp material, and then stuck a film sprocket to the bottom of it. Uh, so if you guys can project how this might run, if you run this through a projector, you're not going to see uh, you're not going to see the uh, frames uh, one frame at a time, but rather you're going to see snapshots of a piece of the frame uh, as a much more scintillating, broken apart um, visual system. And for him, the, the, the critical thing about this particular experiment was that this was a far more effective way to tell the, the, the visual story of a fly in relationship to light rather than follow a moth around with a camera. So what he was attempting to do was build a synthetic form of, uh, of synthetic version of the natural. In other words, he believed that he could get at this event far better through 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 his own way of making a film rather than following and making it look as natural as possible. And I'll show you what that looked like. Anyhow, the, so you see that the, the, the way to understand this is, is, is a little bit more in light of, of, of not necessarily film or what we were seeing in the beginning in the, in, the, in the Godard piece that we saw in the intro. What we see is the inversion of through a title sequence through, through normal, uh, uh, normal syntax of cinema. In that case, it was instead of Film titles, we see, we hear a voice telling us who work in the film rather than see the screen in print. The titles are actually subtitles that have to do with, with translating what's being said, which eventually happens in the film. It's about a film about making a film. Uh, at the end, you also see the, the camera turning against the audience as well. Um, so that's another uh, uh, piece of the syntax that Godard was, uh, was trying to break. And also the notion of, of traveling and continuity, which 
the main camera is fixed and the, the camera in the film itself is moving uh, towards it. But in this case, we have to understand this not necessarily as an experiment film, but rather an experiment between drawing, film, and, uh, and the, uh, some aspect of, of the scientific, or, or sorry, the natural world that is, it is pro-scientific. There's nothing about it we're trying to learn other than the idea that these are constructed, uh, constructed situations. So let's talk with this and show you a little bit more of what we're working on. Um, I'll get the disability. The bugs may so uh, this is where I will start. And this is a project that we put together for a competition that um, Eric Pierenover and the Max Center had organized in, in 06. And it was a, a vertical garden for the Schindler House. They were trying to, to, to react to uh, Lorcan O'Hurley, who's building next door, which Peter uh, was uh, extremely agitated about. So they invited a series, uh, a series of local uh, practitioners who uh, which one were they called to, to provide uh, uh, proposals for what they were calling a vertical garden or a, or a, or a big fence. Um, what we did with this project was to try to, to recolonize the entire lot by building uh, a synergy between a strangler fig species and a consecutive structure. And the idea was that these things were mutually reinforcing both biologically and, and, and structurally. So as you might know, the strangler fig comes from the top. It, 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 uh, it feeds on oxides and it feeds on, uh, on water. The water was very present in the, in, the, in the garden itself. The oxides would be the structure left over time. And, uh, and the idea was also that the stranger fig being parasitic species over time preserves the, 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 the modernist uh, ruin that we were thinking which in our house should be. Um, the, 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 the response to the lot next door was simply one of romanticism, one of going away from it. This is the project that uh, David Fletcher and, and I did together. There was a component of the installation that was also about uh, loop media and, uh, and film, which I won't present today. Um, but there was a there was a necessary triangle done between the way that this project was was solved uh, architecturally, the way that it was attacked uh, biologically, and ultimately the way that it was presented or relocated in, in an imaginary form of, of not necessarily science fiction, but horror, uh, some of them. Some of the models. And by the way, a, a lot of the, we spent a lot of time trying to match the, the actual genetic behavior of the species to the digital models we were building. And um, I believe that over time we succeeded. This is a, this is a project, I'll just show one image of this one, that we are, uh, beginning to build for the Junior League of Los Angeles. This is a, a project that we, uh, we won through, through a small competition that is uh, goes in, in Lake Carroll. And the idea here was to develop a, a, a skin system out of, uh, out of a, a milled slate or milled stone uh, going on to some type of translucent uh, uh, skin system that is not perforated. And the way that we worked out the, the pattern was uh, based on uh, two variations of one cell and, and uh, laid out to, to represent this, this, this type of, of organism that was made to, to, to work with, with weather events.
Um, this is one of the film projects that I'm working on. And this, this stuff is in progress. Um, I'll show you a little bit of that, of, of the leaves that we're getting out in a little bit, so be generous. Um, but this represents the, a, a little bit of, of, at least this is one setup, and, and in this one setup, which we were calling uh, the box, there's a relationship between, between uh, uh, the, the one character, who is this guy right here, who was one of the lead characters in uh, that Cuban uh, uh, poet's film that John and the idea here is that we're juxtaposing the interior of the space, which just to, to an extent is uh, uh, an imaginary space um, that maps the, uh, an entire uh, surveillance system of the Salt Lake uh, region in Utah. So everything that you see on those walls are versions of maps of the region um, that we built one by one. Uh, and they have to do with a piece of a story which is very intensely geolocated. So, so everything refers to a place, and uh, and the, the so the desert scenes that you see uh, interspersed between the the box scenes have to do with that relationship between between place and non-place. Um, again, there is no way that one has this saturation of spatial information in, in any given point in time, even though we're certainly trying to 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 build it up to be one of the main attributes of that character. Um, the desert, of course, is the inversion of that. Um, so it's all sand and, uh, and sky until this character finds a mirror in the desert. I'll play another game. Let's skip through it so that you don't have to do what I do, which is look through hours and hours and hours of nonsense. In 1972, in the vicinity of the Salt Lake in Utah, a military scientist named Percival Blue vanished into the desert to make a film and build a labyrinth. She can see a more about it. This box, attributed to Blue Lady the View, was unearthed by Rogan paleontologist. A search party was immediately sent out to find the man who knew too much about nuclear fission, the chemical soul of the town of Bondage. <laughs> Percival Blue was never found and neither was the labyrinth. The only trace of him passing through the area was an array of blue tapes and smooth diary pages crammed in front of the box. The military activist of the 500 unit failed to uncover Blue's intentions for what appeared to be the film, the location of the labyrinth, as well as the whereabouts of Percival Blue himself. represent the unit's best efforts to assemble the footage into a manual. Considered a total failure, the archivist's voices have been left on the cut, as even the removal is a total waste of resources to make the long of time until a young woman in the unit had an idea. Speaking of San Francisco, this would be you in a green sequin dress on Grand Street. We know that as an adult, she never returned to Chinatown. She settled in Utah with her grandparents at age 12. Blue took her in marriage on her 18th birthday.
1 minute, 39 second, 22 frame difference in the film cut, counting for the vertiginous acceleration of used memory. Hardly a 15 year cut, hardly a smooth bridge between the past and a possible future. If you guys know your, uh, your land art, you will recognize uh, Nancy Holt, Santanos, Robert Smith, and Sarah Jetty. You will recognize a number of re-instantiations of, of Hitchcock's Vertigo, um, some reruns of Chris Marker's Sun Soleil. So the idea is to not just tell a story, but try to find a way to, to keep weaving uh, the syntax of some key pieces of of res uh, not, not just reference material, but rather raw material into, into, the, into the projects, almost as an alternative to, to, to criticism. Um, the more that we do things, the more that I do these things, the more that I, all I want to do is try to figure the right way of editing, which so far is putting me to sleep as well. But um, it's more about finding that thing to speak for what we do rather than try to find words to, to, to represent what what we want to do. I guess Peter Cook was calling the, the creepy guys. Then the next, the next project is uh, a collaboration that, that I did with, with Lydia Lunch of uh, No Way fame, Henry Rollins, uh, William Burroughs, Brian Eno, uh, and Sonic Youth. Uh, at the end of, of the installation uh, that we did here last semester, and and part of the part of the ambition with that was to to have her write uh, a piece of music for it uh, and some lyrics as we developed some type of, of visual uh, story around it. Um, again, it's what we were doing there was not necessarily to to tell the, the story of the of, of the project of the of the Vagari installation, but rather reinstantiated something completely different uh, into something different, even though we were using some of the basic raw material that we were kind of taking off of that. And so what she did was she wrote this 30-minute piece of music which came out of all the sample, the sound samples that we collected during the exhibition of all the bugs and critters that we had in there. And uh, she was calling it this material opera, which was uh, a 30-layer 30 layer piece of music with, with, with all sorts of sound samples that she was doing, and also some words that we wrote over uh, two and a half months of email exchanges. And I kept, she, would, she, wouldn't, she wouldn't take any, any, any corrections or any, any suggestions, so she kept, she kept sending stuff that I always thought was too word. And I kept going, she keeps sending words, and the words, you know, the last thing that you want is people that are not architects talking about architecture overly wordy ways because all those words are crucifixion. And uh, so I have to live with that. But, uh, but anyway, this, this comes from, from, from somebody who was uh, shooting people and doing things on camera in the, in the 70s and 80s. So, so I, would, I would take that as uh, something that we could swallow. So this is a little bit of the imagery that we were working with. And if we go back to the initial images dealing with 
with, uh, with the, 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 the logic of compositing, again, the green screen and, uh, and the idea that you can build a multiplicity of worlds with this layering of uh, temporally synchronized images. That was a little bit of what we were trying to do and uh, with, with some basic light source, which in this case was a series of projectors um, and, and simply some uh, performance time in one thing. So I'll let you go to the middle of that. I already gave you the disclaimer, so I don't want to hear. Anything about the brain? What is it, how is it that we're going to treat these images? What I'll show you is simply the, the raw tape with some uh, initial cards in the front that we were working on. Uh, but what, I really, what I'm really interested in is to find the relationship between the, the image lens, which again is something that, that, that is on the, on the middle. Bacterial operator. I'm going to sell this one night because I make a fortune. So that, that's kind of what it sounds like. Uh, the, again, the, the direction of this is going in is, is building a, a, a layered system with the images. Um, and, and again, this is a little bit of work in progress, but this is the basic, the basic uh, acquis acquisition technique. So these are all the images. Let's see what we can. I won't talk much about this one because Eric and I try to talk about it on the and um, I don't know if I can if I can battle the, the, the conclusions that you already have on um, But essentially what we're trying to do is build a relationship between an enclosure that was meant to keep a high biomass uh, a series of species alive, which were mostly algae. Um, the largest species was uh, was a cricket. And um, it was basically set in terms of hum uh, the controls were humidity, temperature, and moisture. And the moisture was uh, regulated by the introduction of salt into the environment. 
and we wrote the series of software programs to take on the, the data and determine whether it was worth trying or, 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 or keeping moist. Uh, in some ways, it replicates the, 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 the uh, climate of a desert system in which everything tends to, to go to, to dry, and an embalming technique, which, which is about preserving uh, bodies in death. Um, the, the byproduct was, was double. One of them was the object, which was a hermetic black mat ABS flat pyramid. And, uh, and then it was a series of, of, of media strips. You already see those four frames in the bottom. Um, again, if you, if you were watching the, the stem bracket stuff before you start seeing how this, this thing is played out a little bit. But the idea was that everything that you saw from the inside of the thing was a type of recon a, a narrative reconstruction or a post-narrative reconstruction, which was never told to you in one single line, but rather in four images juxtaposed against each other. One of the feeds was a real time feed, the other one was pre-recorded, it showed structure, it showed some of the digital models. Um, the other frame uh, showed something that was delivered by the virtual organisms that we had running in the, in the pyramid, which also had the ability to go into Maya in real time and render an image every few seconds. Uh, so at the end of the day, what you saw was a type of, of broken up mythologization of what happened inside which you were not supposed to go in or see. And so to the left you see some of the, of the things that were actually inside. This is what, this, what the structure looked like. This is how we developed the, the, the backing form, the ABS panels. Um, the, the structure of the panels were developed to create some type of differential inside the structure. So there was an uneven distribution of material and an uneven distribution of, of, of volume points in this surface, so the biology inside it would trend to move rather than stay uh, static. Uh, even though it would probably move anyway, even if the structure was regular, our idea was to try to, to insulate that to a certain extent and to find ways to read that. You see the paneling system, there was a lot to do with designing the real time uh, uh, system of how the technology was going to play. Some of the techniques that we used to build it, some of the diagrams of the sound match, and the photograph of the photograph that I believe Love used and through their and through their press or, or their print quality that back thing disappears entirely. You don't see anything. It's like a black it's like a black garbage bag. So you all you see are the front piece. The interior looked like Dead Ringers, which, which again I think is the other source of input for what I'm what I'm working on, and uh, I'll, in order to, to get at what I think is going on here and how I think we are we're uh, developing our own work, I'll, I'll, what I'll give you guys is, is uh, Reza Negaristani, who wrote Psychonopedia, wrote a piece for for the Bavarian project um, that starts this way, and uh, I'll, I'll read you what what it sounds like. The, the piece was called uh, Zeno Culture Vivified, and he wrote it based on a lot of the media and images that I had sent in the project. So he goes, since Bergson and Gieca, it has been philosophically established that the architecture of life, as it is organically understood, is the inorganic assimilated by the organic so thoroughly that the former becomes incapable of reflecting upon its intensive origins and seeing itself as the resident alien or the inside. That is, abyssal three lifetime scale in spaces remobilized and volumatized by pulsating forces. Irregular partitions of space and asymmetrical geometries which shape what is regarded as the organic realm. The question of life has since become the question of an intrinsic vitalism to which all modes of enculturation, even that of culture, are presupposedly tethered. In such abyssal three life realms are indifferent. 
if not actively resistant to the full assimilation by the culture of life. It is not the free life that is, that is in culture, it is the problematic reconfiguration of such estranging cosmic realms of life that generates tensions and problems which in turn condition the culture of life. Therefore, the culture of life, its transformations across organic differences and its cause of fear are preceded by the life of culture, perhaps even a radical xenoculture that consists of erratic and insurmountable tensions and problems caused by remobilization and recomposition of free life and thus exterior cosmic expenses. The established culture of life scavenges, hoards, and markets the alien artifacts and relics of this xenoculture as its own living spaces, metabolisms, and processes of emergence. So again, rather than understanding uh, emergence or, or non-linear uh, discoveries, I would like to think that it's what I said in the beginning, which events do not just happen. I believe that it's the role of architecture to discover or to, to exhibit that alien force inside of these material systems. Not, not as something that is the product of again, adaptation or or, or self-propelled emergence, but rather one of forced emergence. So this is for me what uh, what I think is currently driving this forward. So, alien. Same.